Greetings from New York. As you say, there are hundreds of protests going on all around the world today as young people, school children from Australia to Iceland come together to protest about what they're calling the crisis of their lifetime. Climate change, of course, and what they see is politicians' inability or unwillingness to do anything about it. On a hot September day, a warming planet dominates the agenda. We are the generation that will save this planet. One generation, the youngest, now leading others before it, demanding urgent action to curb carbon emissions, the so-called die-in staged to warn of what might happen otherwise. There are thousands here today, but hundreds of thousands, even millions, adding their voices elsewhere. And the scale of this global protest, especially the number of young people involved, gives you a clear indication of their growing sense of urgency when it comes to the issue of climate change. Some of the day's first global climate strike protests happened in Australia, where an estimated 300,000 gathered at more than 100 rallies. From Melbourne... to Sydney. This isn't a fringe movement, this isn't a greenie issue, this isn't a lefty issue, this is a human issue. World leaders were vilified over their climate change credentials. Climate action! Now! In New Delhi and in India, as elsewhere, from India to Indonesia, the scale and reach of this protest surely unprecedented. <laughs> this was the scene in Nairobi in Kenya. Climate change is real and it's coming for us and it doesn't matter who you are. Whether you are rich or poor, this thing is real. They protested in Manila, in Bangkok. We're skipping school because the teachers teach us how to work in the future. But if we don't do this, there'll be no future for us to work in. And Hong Kong. <laughs> Even in Kabul, in Afghanistan, they marched under the shadow of the gun. Their message, if war doesn't kill them, climate change will. For those on the front line of rising sea levels in the Pacific Islands came some of the day's most poignant images. And in Germany and Berlin came the most shocking, the melting blocks of ice beneath the gallows, a striking symbol of protest. Europe's capital cities saw some of the biggest crowds take to the streets, echoing to calls for governments to address climate change with far greater urgency. Back in the UK, office workers joined students in the protest. 100,000 gathered in London claimed organisers. One cabinet minister said he couldn't endorse children leaving school for this, but said their voices were being heard. The Labour leader called them an inspiration. And to those who say that school students and college students should be in college today, I say thank you for being here, for teaching me and everybody else a lesson about the environment. From Brighton to Belfast, Cambridge to Cardiff, the UK Student Climate Network claimed more than 200 events had been organised today to raise the alarm for the climate, they said. on the streets of London today than I have ever seen in the Palace of Westminster. Don't ever let anyone tell you that you are not making a difference. You are making history. From a city in France to thousands marching in Rome, to our very own demonstrations in Cape Town and Pretoria. Children have come together to try and save the planet themselves. 16-year-old Greta Thunberg, who inspired her peers across the world with her protest in Sweden, was this week nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. We need change! We need change! These young activists say climate change will have a huge impact on their lives if nothing is done. 
I really want climate change to be something that politicians are discussing leading up to the elections, and I feel like we haven't really seen people talking about it a lot. If we don't do this and take a stand now, there won't be a future. We want the political um, system to just um, take action, because like, right now we don't really see, they're not really prioritizing this. In my poster I have said, what world will my grandchildren be living in as and if we don't do anything soon, then the gra my grandchildren might be having terrible lives with not the luxury that we have and all the nature and animals. I think that here in South Africa we all do need to start banning single-use plastics. Now, the hope of South Africa's so-called climate kids is to get government to act and reduce waste, pollution and the dependency on non-renewable energy. Pilar Sutusa, Parliament. To development and food security. He mentioned the drought in the Western Cape and heavy storms in some parts of Gauteng, the Northwest and other places are signs of the ongoing dangers of climate change. Manalisi Dubase reports. The president issued this warning during his reply to the State of the Nation debate. If we are a country that prioritizes the interests of the poor and the vulnerable, then we need to act with greater urgency to respond to the effects of climate change and make our contribution in preventing it. The rural poor are most affected by climate change ravages. He warned that climate change is the single biggest threat to development and food security. Unless we tackle climate change, we will not be able to meet our developmental objectives. We have ratified the Paris Agreement to combat climate change as part of the global effort to dramatically reduce the rate of global warming. Welcome. Nice to see you. It's a great honor to see you, Patrick Michaels, doctor. A little bit of your background. You're the director of the Center for Study of Science at the Cato Institute. You hold an AB and SM. You hold those degrees in uh, biology, sciences, and plant ecology from the University of Chicago. PhD in ecological climatology from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, 1979. You're past president of the American Association of State Climatologists. You were program chairman for the Committee on Applied Climatology of the American Meteorological Society. You were research professor of environmental sciences at the University of Virginia for 30 years. And I'm giving an extensive you know, background that you have. I'm, I'm giving that to the uh, public so they know you really know what you're talking about. Um, and you're a contributing author and a reviewer of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. All right, let's get started. Climate change, global warming, global cooling, we've heard it all. What's going on out there? Well, the surface temperature of the planet is warmer than it was 100 years ago, about nine-tenths of a degree Celsius. Nine-tenths of a degree Celsius. That's all. Is that a lot? No, it's not a lot. Probably about half, maybe half, of that nine-tenths of a degree might be caused by greenhouse gases. Because when the planet warmed beginning in 1976, the temperature of the stratosphere started to drop. And that's a prediction of greenhouse theory that's not intuitive. You know, the great philosopher of science, Karl Popper, said, if you can meet a difficult prediction with your theory, you can continue to entertain your theory. So the theory is right, but the application of it is wrong. It is nowhere near as warm as it's supposed to be. The computer models are making systematic, dramatic errors over the entire tropics, which is 40% of the Earth, and it's where all our moisture comes from, or almost all of it. And let me stop you there. Yeah. Who does these computer models? Governments. There are 32 families of computer models that are used by the United Nations, each government-sponsored, uh, and all of them are predicting far, far too much warming. The disparity between what's been predicted to happen, which looks like this, and what is happening continues to grow. We know that for a fact. Yeah, you can, because you can just look at the weather balloon temperatures, you can look at the satellite temperatures, you can look at something called the reanalysis data. They all behave in concert. So they're showing the same thing, and the same thing is a lot different than this thing. However, we need to call the special counsel. Special counsel. 
yes, because one model works. And you know what it is? It's the Russian model. So let me get this. So all the government models are like this. Yeah. The Russian model is like this. Yeah. The Russian model has the least warming in it. And the Russian model is the least warming, and the Russian model pretty much follows reality. Yeah. What's been tested over a few decades. Yeah, correct. Why are all these other government models, 31 of them, I guess, yeah. wrong? And why do they all go in the same direction? Up. Be because they are what is called parameterized. That's, they're all parameterized. Can I translate parameterized into English? Fudged. Okay. The don't get the right answer, don't know the right answer for certain phenomena. So we essentially put in code steps that give us what we think it should be. And the systematic error that was made was the models were tuned, as it said, tuned. Tuned to simulate the warming of the early 20th century. Began in 1910, ended in 1945, about 0.45 degrees Celsius. Mark, that could not have been caused by carbon dioxide. Because there wasn't enough. We had to put enough in. The, the background carbon dioxide concentration is 280 parts per million. When the second first warming started, it was 298 parts per million. If the atmosphere is that sensitive, to an 18 ppm change in CO2, we wouldn't be talking about this right, right now, and we'd be sweating bullets. So what you're saying is man-made carbon dioxide earlier, the last century, could not have produced... The early 20th century. Early warming. 20th century could not have produced this heat. So what did? Do we know? Uh, no. And, you know, the three most important words in life may I not know. be I love you. It yeah. might be I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows what kicked off the, that warming. There's a, lots of theories, but we just don't really have a good explanation for that. But because we forced the computer models to say, aha, human influence, CO2 and other stuff, we made the models too sensitive. And so that's why when you get to the late 20th century, all of a sudden they're warming up like crazy and the reality's down here. It was, it was guaranteed to happen. There, this was revealed in Science Magazine in late 2016, uh, and there was a paper that was published uh, by a French climate modeler called The Art and Science of Climate Model Tuning. And in it, he speaks of parameterizing, we could say fudging, the models to give his words an anticipated acceptable range of results. So it's the scientist, not the science, that's determining how much it's going to warm. Does our EPA do that? Does NASA do that? Ah, Who does that for Ah, aha. Good question, Mark. Because the EPA was told by the Supreme Court in 2007 that if it found that carbon dioxide endangered human health and welfare, that it had the power to regulate it under the Clean Air Act. This is the Massachusetts That's case. Mass v. EPA. Well, they produced an endangerment finding in 2009. And the endangerment finding for its prospective climate is 100%. I didn't say 90%. I said 100% based on those models. So if you can demonstrate that those models systematically are not working, you can take down the endangerment finding. Uh, and that would be the basis for all those policies that came out of the Obama administration. Which would mean you don't get to regulate. Absolutely. Carbon dioxide. Absolutely. The endangerment finding is the heart of the matter. So you're agreement. telling us that we have a massive bit of public policy that has an yeah. enormous effect on society. Absolutely. That's built on, I'll use my word, phony models. It's built on a house of cards. The models really don't work. And, and if I could really be arcane, I can explain the mechanism uh, uh, as to why they don't work. As long as I understand it. The models systematically predict that as you go up in the atmosphere in the tropics, which are 40% of the Earth, that the temperature should rise dramatically as you go further up in the atmosphere. So when you get to the level of the jet stream, the computer models are predicting seven times. I didn't say seven-tenths of a degree. I said seven times more warming than is being observed. Well, why is that important? Why am I boring you with that? Because it's the vertical distribution of temperature that determines upward motion 
which means it determines precipitation. And guess what? Almost all the atmospheric moisture that we have around us today in humid Washington, D.C., that comes from the tropics. So if you get that vertical motion wrong down there, you get all the subsequent variables wrong. It's a fantastic systematic error. And again, that along with the difference between the surface temperatures, or, or rather the lower atmospheric temperatures and what's being observed, that's sufficient to kill the endangerment finding. Okay, so to the average pedestrian like me, if you get that wrong, what does that mean? You get all the weather models wrong? You get, you get the wrong? subsequent weather wrong. Yeah. There's no relationship whatsoever between the accumulated cyclone energy and the surface temperature of the Earth. It's just not there. Now, what, wait, wait a minute. Why does our government say this? They said it in their uh, last report called uh, Global Climate Change Impacts in the United States. They said, oh, there's been a significant increase in hurricane power in the Atlantic Ocean uh, from like 1970 to 2009 or something like that, 1980 to 2009. Well, wait a minute. Why'd you stop in 2009? It's a 2014 report. Because if you take the data after 2009, the increase goes away and it goes back to where it was. Or why did you start in the mid-1970s? Because we have records that are really good back to 1920. And if you look 1920 to 1950, you see an increase that is exactly the same as the one that occurred. So, the, so the information they're providing us it's, is it's skewed. Incomplete. It's skewed. It's skewed. They're cherry picking. Uh-huh. And here we rely on the climatologists, the right. meteorologists. The Vatican never sleeps. They are always planning. They plan events and circumstances and uh, political and religious moves decades, centuries, even millennia in advance. But the Bible tells us exactly what the final events will be. So you have to you have to look at the events and collate them and compare them to prophetic interpretations. And where are we moving towards? Well, the Bible tells us that this system that controlled the world in the Middle Ages that that same system will control the kingdoms at the end of time. So there must be political moves to get the kingdoms in line with its agenda. And this must be on a universal scale. And there must be religious moves on a universal scale to get everybody to accept the primacy of the papacy. And once the political and the religious issues are in harmony again with one another and with the Vatican, then she will again control events as she did in the Middle Ages. So you have to ask yourself, are there global events which are taking place? And the answer is yes. Uh, if you take the issue of climate change, is there an encyclical from Rome which says that climate change must be addressed universally? And the answer is yes, Laudato Si, which the Pope Francis wrote. Does it contain religious elements? Absolutely. It contains the Eucharist worship. It contains the Trinity. It contains Mariology. It contains what the saints wrote. It contains uh, issues of worship and which day Sunday, for example, it contains all those elements and you have to ask yourself the question, what has the Eucharist got to do with climate change? You have to ask yourself, what has Mariology got to do with climate change? You have to ask yourself, what has Sunday keeping got to do with climate change? But the, all of those elements are in Laudato Si. Then you have to go and check out and see Who's talking about Laudato Si? Who is saying that this agenda of the Vatican must be implemented on a worldwide scale? And then you find the religious systems, one after the other, as you go through them, endorsing what the Pope had said. And you will find, if you click on uh, 
the parliament of world religions, which is a conglomerate of all the religions in the world, what are they saying? They're pushing the agenda. And then you go to the political arena and you ask yourself, well, what is the political world saying about this? And then you have the Paris Accord, and they all agreed, but some countries did not agree. The United States, for example, didn't want to go along with it. Is there any move in that direction? Then you get to the G20 summit, and you find out what did they do about it. And you'll see that the, the role players, the religious role players, the economic role players, the sporting role players, they were all involved in that. Was there any definitive action thereafter? Yes, there was. So obviously the agenda is moving in that direction. Now, how are you going to implement it then on a worldwide scale? Well, you have to enforce these, these accords. And uh, as the Vatican says, it has to be written in red letters. What does that mean? Well, if you take your Bible and you see what is written in red letters, then it's the words of Christ. So the words of the representative so-called of Christ are also written in le red letters, politically speaking. So are they going to implement these things? Under what basis? And then you look at what the agenda of the Vatican is and you check it out on vatican.va, what are they doing? And you will see that one of the buzzwords for our time is common good. And what is common good? Well, something that is common good for all humanity. Climate change issue is obviously for the common good because everybody must be on board. Mm -hmm. And so you put those things together and you can see that they're very busy. Are they aligning the religious systems? Well, absolutely. Hasn't Pope Francis signed an accord with the imams that they will work together? Hasn't he in the ecumenical movement gathered all the religious role players under one roof? And the answer is yes. So are we progressing towards this final goal of the papal agenda? You have to be blind if you want to say it's not so. Of course it is so. Prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes. And uh, people are ignoring the facts. If we just collate the information, we can see that there is tremendous progress in the papal agenda for world domination on every level. Pope Francis urges carbon tax to avert climate catastrophe. Pope Francis warned of disastrous consequences if humanity does not immediately react to the threat of climate change, since the world has reached a critical moment and there is no time to waste. Further, I'm now joined in studio by uh, Louis Boto, who is the associate, uh, is an associate in the uh, tax and exchange control practice. Thanks very much for joining us and welcome to the program. Thank you, Peter. I thought carbon taxes were for the European countries and that um, African nations, we've been exempt because we're generally clean by and large. Yeah, if, if only that were the case. Mm. Um, so as a bit of background, of course, yeah. South Africa has certain, certain obligations under the Paris Agreement uh, to reduce our, our carbon emissions. And essentially the carbon tax legislation, which has been in the pipeline for uh, quite a number of years, um, will now come into effect in an attempt for South Africa to meet um, our obligations under the Paris Agreement. Three carbon tax bills introduced in Congress. Given concerns about man-made climate change, lawmakers will continue to explore different options for introducing a carbon tax. Republican Rooney files carbon tax bill with big trade-off. Republican Francis Rooney introduced legislation in Congress this week to tax heat-trapping air pollution from burning fossil fuels and use the revenue to cut payroll taxes for employees and employers. Tampa Democrat Kathy Caster, who chairs the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, praised Rooney's proposal. She says, glad to see concrete legislation like this from a Republican member of Congress. Surge in young Republicans worried about the environment. A growing majority of U.S. Republicans, especially younger voters, are worried that human behavior is damaging the planet. 
The number of Republican voters aged 18 to 34 who are worried about the issue rose by 18 percentage points to 67 percent. Quote, if Donald Trump keeps on denying climate change and refrains from standing up for the environment, he won't be able to increase support. This isn't a fringe movement. This isn't a greeny issue. This isn't a lefty issue. This is a human issue. The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade or compel all classes to honor the Sunday. Political corruption is destroying love of and regard for truth and in order to secure public favor, legislators will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Well, I find these politics uh, currently very interesting and I put them into the category of Hegelian dialectic. Hegelian dialectic is when you place two opposites into an environment and you rub them up against each other so that eventually you get a synthesis. But you can't get a synthesis until the two opposites have been brought together. So the world has experienced the one extreme of secularism and liberalism and now the world has gone or is going to the opposite stream of extreme conservatism and society, depending on what side you are on, is screaming either for or against this issue. Right. And the louder they scream and the greater the conflict is, because that's how Gaelism works, you bring them together to a synthesis. And if you can, can join and link up the elements that they want of the conservative view with the liberal view, then you will have exactly the pathway that the Vatican would like to be able to control not only the secular thinking, but also the religious thinking. So it's part of a game, as okay. far as I'm concerned. And they're playing it well. I give them full marks. <laughs> I think I'm going to add a question there. Do you think they know they are part of the game? Well, there are politicians in the past that have said on the, on the political scale, nothing happens by chance. If you look at Trump, you will see that he has been groomed for this position for decades with his interaction with the White House. And they called him the dove and they wrote articles about what he will do in the future. And he's fulfilling all of those things. So, it would be naive for us to think that people arise on the political gender by mere chance. These things are planned long in advance. Saludo a los participantes en la cumbre sobre la acción climática ONU 2019. Quisiera dar las gracias al secretario general de las Naciones Unidas, el señor Antonio Guterres por la convocatoria de este encuentro, así como por haber atraído la atención de los jefes de Estado y de gobierno y de toda la comunidad internacional y de la opinión pública mundial sobre uno de los fenómenos más graves y preocupantes que está viviendo nuestra época, el cambio climático. Se trata de uno de los principales desafíos que debemos afrontar Y para ello, la humanidad está llamada a cultivar tres grandes cualidades morales. Honestidad, responsabilidad y valentía. Con el Acuerdo de París del 12 de diciembre de 2015, la comunidad internacional tomó conciencia de la urgencia y necesidad de dar una respuesta colectiva para colaborar en la construcción de nuestra casa común junto a tantas iniciativas, no solo por parte de los gobiernos, sino de toda la sociedad civil, es necesario preguntarse si existe una verdadera voluntad política para destinar mayores recursos humanos, financieros y tecnológicos a fin de mitigar los efectos negativos del cambio climático y ayudar a las poblaciones más pobres y vulnerables que son las que más lo sufren. 
El problema del cambio climático está relacionado con cuestiones que tienen que ver con la ética, la equidad, la justicia social. La situación actual de degrado ambiental está conectada con el degrado humano, ético y social tal y como experimentamos cada día. Y esto nos obliga a pensar sobre el sentido de nuestros modelos de consumo y de producción y en los procesos de educación y de concientización para hacer que sean coherentes con la dignidad humana. Estamos frente a un desafío de civilización en favor del bien común. Mr. Speaker, the Pope of the Holy See. Words never before uttered in history to introduce a figure who came to prod this partisan institution to work together for a better future. In a renewed spirit of fraternity and solidarity, cooperating generously for the common good. Francis delivered his signature caution about capitalism and warnings about climate change that made some Republicans uncomfortable. Environmental deterioration caused by human activity. Liberals like presidential hopeful Bernie Sanders were ecstatic. That is the issue of poverty, the issue of environmental degradation, immigration, the death penalty, the need to do everything we can to create a peaceful world. The common good has become global. Pope Francis called on nations to work toward a global common good Thursday, particularly in confronting climate change. Pope Francis said that when a supranational common good is clearly identified, as in the case of climate change or human trafficking, it necessitates a special legal authority capable of facilitating solutions. Pope Francis quoted St. Thomas Aquinas, noting that he believes St. Thomas has a beautiful idea of what it means to be a people. Let's be honest, Catholic teaching doesn't always forbid the death penalty. The death penalty can sometimes support the common good. St. Thomas Aquinas makes this point. Therefore, if a man be dangerous and infectious to the community on account of some sin, it is praiseworthy and advantageous that he be killed in order to safeguard the common good. The traditional teaching that the death penalty is legitimized by justice and expiation has not changed simply because of the passage of time, but today the Church's traditional doctrine is presented as though it hinged on deterrence of simple physical protection of the public. Although the Catechism obviously contains many infallible statements, some of its formulations are not infallible. A Catholic must give the Catechism due consideration when weighing moral issues, but when a difference arises, we must weigh the claims of the Catechism against those of tradition. Vatican changes Catechism teaching on the death penalty, calls it inadmissible. The Vatican changed on Thursday the Catechism of the Catholic Church's teaching on the permissibility of the death penalty, which the Church has taught is legitimate in limited cases. Until now, the Church has consistently taught that the state has the authority to use the death penalty in cases of absolute necessity. For the first time in nearly two decades, the U.S. government will resume its use of capital punishment. Attorney General Attorney William General Barr announced Thursday that the Justice Department has scheduled the executions of five federal death row inmates, the first of which will take place this December. Despite a moratorium that stretches back to 2003 when the last federal execution took place, a reversal in policy has been in the works from almost the moment Donald Trump took office, says Reuters correspondent Sarah Lynch. So what has been the issue that has been transpiring in the last few months. Well, one of the important things that Pope Francis said in this year is that the issue of common good had to become global. That means every single country in the world has to implement the principles of common good. And common good are based on Greek philosophy and Roman philosophy and has to be enforced by the state. The problem, of course, is who defines what is the common good. And in the past, there have been many occasions when common good has been defined. For example, in South America, 
it was common good that a Protestant was not to marry a Catholic and those marriages weren't recognized. That was for the common good. So the common good is something that is defined by none other than the Pope. So what is it defining as a common good? As we said, climate change issues. The Vatican and UN Environment bring faith organizations together to care for our common home. The UN Environment Program's Faith for Earth initiative with its slogan One Earth, Many Religions, One Goal aims to tap into and harness the enormous goodwill and power of the world's religious authorities and believers to make a positive difference to our global environment. July 2019 is the fourth anniversary of La Dao to Sea, the second encyclical of Pope Francis, specifically on the environment. In it, the Pope calls on all people of the world to take swift and unified global action against unsustainable practices. Islamic Declaration on Climate Change Islamic leaders have called on the world's 1.6 billion Muslims to play an active role in combating climate change. Rabbinic Letter on Climate Torah, Pope and Crisis inspire 425 plus rabbis to call for vigorous climate action. The time to act is now. A Buddhist Declaration on Climate Change Today we live in a time of great crisis, confronted by the gravest challenge that humanity has ever faced, the ecological consequences of our own collective karma. Million turn out for Pope Francis Madagascar Mass. Pope Francis in Africa, Hindus attended the Mass in Mauritius. Church of England issues strong call for long-term climate action. The top decision-making body of the Church of England, the National General Senate, has strongly backed long-term climate action with a wide-ranging motion that received an overwhelming majority of votes. The motion comes as the Archbishops of Melbourne and of the Anglican Church of South Africa stressed the moral imperative of climate action in a joint editorial published in the Canberra Times yesterday. More and more religious leaders are reminding world leaders that acting on climate change is a moral obligation. Ecumenical and Interfaith Network plan non-stop shared celebration, reflection and advocacy during COP25. Christians and Muslims, Buddhists and Baha'is, members of indigenous and interfaith organizations have come together in Chile to form a spiritual alliance ahead of the COP25 conference which will take place in the capital Santiago in December 2019. More than 20 religious, ecumenical and interreligious networks met together on 21 July to sign an agreement showing their common commitment to care for the earth and to promote systematic, cultural and spiritual change to tackle the climate crisis. Pope Francis pushes a new theology of climate change. 30 years ago, Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople put September 1 on the Orthodox calendar as the World Day of Prayer for the Care of the Creation. Last month, Pope Francis did the same for the Catholic Church and on Sunday he marked the occasion by issuing a new message on climate change. Moving beyond his 2015 encyclical La Dao to Sea, Francis called for prophetic action to spur governments to undertake drastic measures to achieve zero net greenhouse gas emissions and keep average global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Pope and Grand Imam Historic Declaration of Peace, Freedom, Women's Rights The document on human fraternity for world peace and living together is not only a milestone in relations between Christianity and Islam but also represents a message with a strong impact on the international scene. The document opens with a series of invocations. The Pope and the Grand Imam speak in the name of God who has created all human beings equal in rights duties and dignity. Al-Azhar and the Catholic Church ask that this document become the object of research and reflection in all schools, universities and institutes of formation and they hope that the declaration will become a sign of the closeness between East and West, between North and South. 
Carissimi, nell'enciclica Laudato Si, ho invitato tutti a collaborare per custodire la nostra casa comune, per capire quanto è urgente sia la sfida che abbiamo davanti, dobbiamo puntare sulla educazione, che apre la mente e i cuori ad una comprensione più larga e più profonda della realtà. Serve un patto educativo globale che ci educhi alla solidarietà universale, a un nuovo umanesimo. Per questo ho promosso un evento mondiale che si terrà il 14 maggio di 2020, in un momento di estrema frammentazione, di estrema contrapposizione, c'è bisogno di unire gli sforzi, di far nascere un'alleanza educativa per formare persone mature capaci di vivere nella società e per la società. Ogni cambiamento però ha bisogno di un cammino educativo. Noi non possiamo fare un cambiamento senza educare a quel cambiamento. Un proverbio africano recita che per educare un bambino serve un intero villaggio. Ma dobbiamo costruirlo, questo villaggio, tutti insieme, per educare i bambini, per educare il futuro. E dobbiamo modificare il terreno delle discriminazioni, come ho sostenuto nel documento che ho recentemente sottoscritto col grande imam di Al-Assar ad Abu Dhabi. Dobbiamo fare in modo che questo villaggio faccia crescere in tutti la consapevolezza di ciò che unisce le persone e tutte le componenti della persona. Lo studio e la vita, generazioni, i docenti e gli studenti, la famiglia e la società civile, con le sue espressioni politiche, produttive, imprenditoriali e solidali. Dobbiamo fare in modo che in questo villaggio nasca una convergenza globale per un'alleanza tra gli abitanti della terra e la casa comune, affinché l'educazione sia creatrice di pace, di giustizia, sia accoglienza tra tutti i popoli della famiglia umana, nonché di dialogo tra le, no le loro religioni. Un villaggio universale, ma un villaggio anche personale di ognuno. Dobbiamo fondare i processi educativi sulla consapevolezza che tutto nel mondo è intimamente connesso ed è necessario trovare altri modi di intendere l'economia, la politica, la crescita e il progresso. Dobbiamo avere il coraggio di formare persone disponibili a mettersi al servizio della comunità. Per questo desidero incontrarvi a Roma per promuovere insieme e attivare questo patto educativo. Insieme a voi faccio appello a tutte le personalità pubbliche che a livello mondiale sono già impegnate nel dedicato settore dell'educazione delle nuove generazioni. Ho fiducia che non si tireranno indietro. Cerchiamo insieme di trovare soluzioni, avviare i processi di trasformazione senza paura. Invito ciascuno di voi ad essere protagonista di questa alleanza. L'appuntamento è per il giorno 14 maggio 2020 a Roma. Vi aspetto e fin d'ora vi saluto e benedico. Grazie. Uh, another issue that is being pushed is the unification of Catholicism with, with Protestantism. And there we had, of course, this whole idea of the mantle of uh, Billy Graham coming down in a sort of Elijah Force message. And uh, stadiums are being filled and all the great tele-evangelists are involved kissing each other's feet and saying that 
Catholicism and Protestantism has buried the hatcher because they have exactly the same spirit. Now, does the same spirit necessarily mean that it is a cohesive movement? Aren't we supposed to test the spirits to see if they are of God? Can two walk together lest they agree? Catholicism teaches that Christ never died for you. He did die, but he didn't die for you. You still have to pay your own sins, pay for your own sins, even if they are forgiven. And that is why you go to purgatory, to pay for your sins. But Jesus paid for the sins according to the scripture. So how can Protestantism and Catholicism, where one denies the atonement and the other one supposedly embraces the atonement, come together? That is an impossibility. And now they're saying, like Benny Hinn said, that there are more miracles taking place in Catholicism than in Protestantism because of the Eucharist and the understanding of it being the literal body and a literal sacrifice. Now, excuse me, the Bible says by one sacrifice they have, it has forever been made perfect. So, one sacrifice, not hundreds of sacrifices. So how these two organizations can come together and claim to be one because the manifestations are similar in the charismatic Catholicism and charismatic Protestantism, that is beyond comprehension. Uh, we are to base our faith on the Word of God, not on manifestations. Okay, here's, here's the deal. I believe that the Catholic Church and the Christian Church are going to come together right now. So Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, for a mighty baptism on the Catholic Church, God. Holy Spirit, more. Fire. Jesus' name. Fire of heaven. In the name of Jesus. We're a delegation, a Catholic delegation, and I come from e Italy. Vi porto il saluto da parte di 150 milioni di cattolici carismatici. And I bring you a salute from 150 million charismatic Catholics. We want to, Lou, kiss your feet as Catholics and just honor you with this gesture right now. Raise up Catholics all over the world. One billion souls of Catholics to come into the kingdom of God. The hour is coming. The chains are broken. The loosing of the Lord upon every single Catholic in the world. That they would see the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A revival will spring forth in the Catholic Church like never before. This is Holy Spirit. Dello spirito di divisione because you're breaking the spirit of division tu prepari un grande risveglio in you're preparing a great revival all in it years that the love of Jesus is here and it's now and then now is the time for a mission movement that will touch every people on the earth one two three Many across the body of Christ have had a sense in your heart that a massive spiritual awakening is coming to America. Now is the time for spiritual awakening and that now is the time for a massive missions wave to the nations of the earth. In 2011, a major revelatory shift took place. Into my living room walked these YWAM wild men and they begin to prophesy there's coming a shift to the call. And it will not just be fasting and prayer, but the proclamation of the gospel. Signs and wonders and stadiums will be filled. And Billy Graham's mantle's coming on the nation. And then they said, the call is going to lead to the send. And it struck me, maybe the call is a forerunner for a new Jesus movement coming.
it put me in shock and I knew it had a time period to look to the place and time when Billy Graham would die. At that moment, a massive shift's coming and it will not just be John the Baptist, it will be Jesus the Evangelist is going to fill stadiums in America. From that moment on, a dream exploded in my spirit that if I saw stadiums filled with young people fasting and praying, why wouldn't I believe that I would see stadiums filled with massive evangelism, signs and wonders and miracles and hundreds of thousands of people being saved in America? If I saw the first fulfillment, why couldn't I believe for the second fulfillment? And so what we see is that there are these moments in history where the power of God is present to do something extraordinary. There's an opportunity. There is an open door. And what happens is, is that if that generation will step through that open door by faith and take action, they can literally see history change. We believe this day something will transfer and bring us into, I believe, worldwide transition into the greatest Jesus movement we have ever seen. I'm going to pray one prayer, only one prayer. I'm going to pray that God will increase your faith tonight to believe for your miracle. I want to say to pastors here tonight, you need to be in the front first, sir. Not behind your flock, in front of your flock. In Israel, we lead the sheep. We don't chase the sheep. There are sick people here tonight. The doctor said there's no more we can do for you but God. But God. But God. The biggest revival the world's ever seen is going to start. The biggest revival the world has ever seen. 6 weeks. Six weeks. So Catholicism and Protestantism are coming together. The global good has been defined as universal. The climate change issue is being pushed together with Sunday legislation. All of these issues combined tell us that the end is at hand. Naomi's church now presents a fair front to the world, covering with apologies her record of horrible cruelties. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of popery that existed in ages past exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. Let none deceive themselves. The popery that Protestants are now so ready to embrace and honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation, when men of God stood up at the peril of their lives to expose her iniquity. Popery is just what prophecy declared she would be. The apostasy of the latter times. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. 
but beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. It is not without reason that the claim has been put forth that Catholicism is now almost like Protestantism. There has been a change, but the change is in Protestants, not in Romanists. In the movements now in progress in this country, to secure for the institutions and usages of the church the support of the state, Protestants are following in the steps of Papists. Nay, more, they are opening the door for Popery to regain in Protestant America the supremacy which she has lost in the old world. And that which gives greater significance to this movement is the fact that the principal object contemplated is the enforcement of Sunday observance, a custom which originated with Rome and which she claims as a sign of her authority. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. Talking about um, Jesus coming, uh, what do you think is missing for him to come? The fulfillment of prophecy. That's all that's missing. As soon as the mark of the beast is implemented, then the end times events will occur. Are they working towards implementing the mark of the beast? The answer is yes. If I look at the papal agenda, as we discussed earlier, they are busy implementing this agenda. So I believe the time is short rather than long. Some people believe that we have to all be perfect before Christ comes. And that would make the coming of Christ dependent upon human perfection. Mm -hmm. Is God subject to human perfection in order to fulfill his promises in the Bible? My, my supposition would be definitely not. He's God. He's sovereign. So why has he not come yet? Well, he is long-suffering, not wishing that anyone should perish. So where does that onus lie, on me or on him? It lies on him. Mm -hmm. I always prefer a theology when, where the events are subject to him and not subject to me. If I can encourage anyone that's listening, time is very short. And uh, who is the one that comes into relationship with God and is taken up into heaven? Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the Father enters into the kingdom of heaven. So obedience is one thing and is not to be equated with fanaticism. Simple obedience and trust in God and uh, we will be able to, to survive the issues that are coming upon the world because he has promised that he will not let his people perish. So be faithful, trust in him, do what is right with his help, and not one of you will be lost. Thank you.